Welcome back to our lecture on quantum information theory. In our last lecture before the holidays, uh, we finished the chapter on quantum computation and we are now starting with a new chapter on quantum information. Okay? In particular, what I'd like to recall now in the beginning is uh, the very simple scheme that we considered when we motivated the lecture in our first lecture. Okay? So in our first lecture, we, saw, we, we said that suppose we have some information, okay, as an example, a music track, okay, say this information is M, and what we then considered is uh, an encoding of this information. And first, we considered this classically, so we supposed uh, that we could encode this on a classical information carrier, for a music track, an example would be a tape. And then what we do with this carrier is uh, we can store it or we can send it from A to B, whatsoever. And during this uh, process of storing or sending, there might be some, uh, some thing acting on this information carrier such that uh, if you later on measure it and decode the information, for example, via a... Uh, a, a recording system, right? Then you possibly get back a slightly different information because you possibly had a scratch on the tape or something like this. And now, if you consider this scenery from a quantum mechanical point of view, then we do this encoding on, of information. We encode this on a quantum state, say on rho, so this is rho m, and then we can do a very similar thing. We can store this information, so we have to store this quantum state, or we can send it from A to B through a channel, whatever. So there is something going on here, let's call this uh, sending or storing. And during this sending or storing, there might be some influences on your state. For example, there could be this, uh, the surrounding world interacting with this. Okay, such that you get some noise or whatever, so something changes your state, and this is unwanted. And then you do a, a decoding, so measurement and decoding. And you get back some information, uh, say, M prime. And um, if you remember what we did so far, especially in our uh, second chapter about quantum computation, we, there we merely considered um, unitary operations. So meaning we, we considered a closed system and we formulated postulate 2, which tells us that the, uh, the evolution of a closed system is unitary. And due to this, all of our considerations of, uh, about quantum computation so far were within a closed system and so it was unitary. So this circuit model that we developed and all these quantum uh, algorithms based on the circuit that we saw, this is all a unitary transformation. Okay? Now we're going to change the game. Okay? What we want to describe now is exactly what's happening here. And we want to describe what's happening if there is an environment interacting with our system such that the evolution is not unitary anymore. Okay? Such that we have here some non-unitary evolution. And so this is going to be the first part uh, of our chapter on quantum information. And after we describe this uh, by in terms of um, quantum operations, we then uh, turn uh, to, to the task of comparing these two states. Okay? So we then develop some tools how we can compare two different quantum states and how we can quantify how, uh, how different or how similar they are, right? So this then, we're going to do this in a couple of weeks. And after that, we're going to see, uh, going to go a little bit more, I think, into entanglement theory. And then in the end, we will see where, where it goes, okay? So let's now first, uh, in two days, in the next few lectures, we're going to focus on uh, quantum operations, which are not necessarily unitary. So we want to build up a formalism for quantum operations, which describe very general uh, operations. Okay, so this is now chapter three, quantum information. And first, 
we're going to describe quantum, quantum noise and quantum operations. Um, so let me briefly summarize what I just said. So we have that real systems, they suffer from unwanted interactions. With the outside world, which we simply term the environment. And these interactions, they manifest as noise in quantum information processing. And we're going to describe now such open quantum systems. Let's describe it via this formalism of quantum operations. which is a powerful tool or let's say to address a wide range of scenarios. Okay, so by this, I mean that it's going to be a very general description of quantum operations, and this you can really use as a toolbox for very many different scenarios. And we, I also going to provide some examples at some point. Okay, and let's now first uh, define a quantum operation. Okay, and the first definition is. Uh, kind of a particular in, uh, definition is the definition of a trace preserving quantum operation. It simply uh, defines an operation as trace preserving, as it says, and meaning that we map density operators to density operators. Okay, so it's definition 3.1. Trace preserving So it's usually uh, abbreviated by TP for trace preserving quantum operation. It's a transformation of a quantum state. meaning a density operator rho on our Hilbert space H according to the map that we call this E, capital E, and it maps from the space of density operators to the space of density operators. 
So it takes h, uh, so it takes rho, and it maps it to e of rho. So remember that we denote that d of h as the space of density operators on H. D is the space of density operators. And this means that E simply maps density operators to density operators. Okay, so, so far in our lecture, we already came across two examples of such a map, okay? So the first example is a unitary transformation. So because a unitary transformation does map density operators to density operators. And the second example that we've seen is measurement, right? If you perform a measurement, then the, we get as a post-measurement state, again, a density operator, meaning that a measurement is also an example for such a trace-preserving quantum operation. So we came across two examples. Unitary transformation. So here we have that E of rho is equal to U rho U dagger with U unitary and measurement. So we have, I say it now, E with uh, subscript M of rho is then, so is, is then a measurement operator M rho m dagger divided by trace thereof. So this was the post-measurement state with the measurement operator capital M. And this is a trace 1 state, a positive trace 1 state. So it's a density operator, the post-measurement state, meaning that it maps density operators to density states. OK. So. Uh, as I said in the beginning, what we want to do now is we want to introduce an environment, right? And we want to describe interactions between system and environment and the quantum operations thereof. So let us now introduce uh, the environment. So it's 3.1.1. So, and therefore, I first like to recall that from postulate two, I think this was in section 1.3.1, yeah? so in the very beginning when we uh, introduced the postulates, uh, this says that uh, the evolution of a closed system is unitary. Right? And now we want to describe the evolution of an open system. And this, from this point of view, it's now natural to consider a composed system which is composed of the principal system, so our principal system and the environment. And we then, so according to postulate two, we can then describe this composed, uh, the, we can then describe the evolution of this composed system as unitary, right? And then, since we only want to have uh, the evolution of our principal system, we have to trace out the environment after this, uh, after this unitary evolution of principal system and environment together. Right. So, from postulate two, in section one point three point one, 
we know that a closed quantum system evolves unitarily Hence, it is natural to consider evolution of an open, and we usually call this a principal system. So the principal system is the system under consideration. And we uh, consider this to be generated by a unitary evolution. Uni of a larger system composed of the principal system and an environment. Okay. What we do next is we now assume that the initial state of our principal system and the environment is uncorrelated. Right? So there are initially there are no correlations between principal system and environment. And this we assume because you can often prepare such uncorrelated states in the lab. So it's very it's a very it's a good assumption that we can do. Right? You can also assume that there are correlations and there is ongoing research also here. Uh, in, in Freiburg, so in the group of Professor Breuer, they're doing, uh, they, they do consider uh, open quantum systems where there are initial correlations, but we're going to start very simple and consider an uncorrelated state, and as I said, it's a good assumption, because we can prepare such sta states in the lab. So, by assuming no initial correlations between system or between principal system and environment so we write the status rho tensor rho e. So this is our initial state of the principal system and this is the initial state of the environment and they are uncorrelated. So we uh, write this as a tensor product. Then this, the corresponding map reads as follows. Then we have that the map of our initial state given by the trace over the environment of a unitary evolution of our, our composed state of system and environment. Okay, let me briefly recall what we did. So, uh, we are considering a principal system, which is initially in the state row. And we now ask for a quantum operation, which describes an interaction with an environment. Right? And what we say is, due to postulate 2, which says that every closed system uh, evolves unitarily, what we do is, we now make a, consider a larger system, so our principal system and an environment, and suppose that this larger system evolves unitarily. Okay? This is described by this unitary evolution here. And this is the larger system. 
where initially we have no correlations between system and environment. And then, in order to get the operation of our principal system, we simply have to trace over the environment. Okay? And then we're left with, with a state of our system. Okay, let me first give you a few me remarks. The first one, uh, I already mentioned this, the first one. So, the first one is that it's reasonably to assume an uncorrelated initial state. Since such states can often be prepared in the lab. Okay, the second, second remark is as follows. So we want this uh, to be consistent with our postulate 2, right? I mean, actually, we kind of built this on postulate 2. But we can now check whether this is consistent if we suppose a unitary uh, where there are no interactions between system and environment. And then what we have to get out is a unitary evolution of our principal system, right? So let's do this consistency, consistency check. So if U describes no interactions, between the principal system and the environment, meaning that we can write U as a unitary evolution of our principal system, tensor a unitary evolution of the environment. Okay, so in this case, there are no interactions between them. And then, now let's plug in this equation 3.2. Then we have E of rho is equal to trace of environment. And then we have U system tensor U environment. And here we have rho tensor rho environment and U system dagger tensor U environment dagger, which is equal to trace of environment. And then we have U system rho U system dagger tensor U environment rho environment U environment dagger. Right, and if you trace out the environment, then we see what's left is U system rho U system dagger, which is consistent with postulate 2. Okay, so we assumed no interactions between system and environment, and from this 
equation 3.2, we then see that we get a unitary evolution of our principal system. Makes sense because postulate 2 says that a closed system evolves unitarily. Right, so it's consistent. And as a third remark, so let me now recall that for the environment, the initial state of the environment is here described as a density operator, right? But you can remember that uh, we introduced uh, purification. And what is purification? Very brief, briefly, we extend the Hilbert space such that we can write the density operator in this extended Hilbert space as a pure state. Okay? And this we can do here because we are not interested actually on the environment. We are only interested on the principal system. So what we can do is we can extend the Hilbert space of the environment such that this initial state can be written as a pure state. And this means that it is very reasonably to assume that the initial state and that the initial state of the environment is a pure state. Because if it's not, then we can simply purify it by enlarging the space state of the environment. Okay. So by the possibility to purify the environment, I think this was equation 1.54. It is sufficient to consider the environment initially in a pure state. And we write this as the as E naught, right? So this is the initial state of the environment. Okay, let me do now an example. So let me do an example for such a quantum operation. And uh, consider that the circuit um, so suppose we have a as an example take a um, a qubit in this, the state described by the density operator rho right and I suppose that we have a second state for example in zero and then consider the map such as if we have here the not gate and we get here out E of rho. So and we want to describe this map E of rho. So this circuit it illustrates a map E of rho with combined initial state Row zero zero So the unitary can briefly think how this unitary looks like. So what it does is if you look at the circuit if our initial state is in 1, then it flips this, the environment state. And if it's in 0, it doesn't. Right? And from this, we can simply write down how this unitary on the composed system looks like.
and unitary u. So it uses as follows if our uh, principal system is in state zero, then nothing happens. And if it is in one, then we get a flip of the environment qubit, so to say. Uh, let me brief, let me write this such that we have these projectors on zero and one. Let me write this as simply as P to abbreviate the notation. P zero, P one. So hence, now we can plug in what was equation 3.2 to get a description of this quantum operation, right? So it, this one is trace over the second qubit, which is, describes the environment. And what we trace over is uh, the unitary evolution uh, of our composed system. So it's P0 tensor 1 plus P1 tensor x. Okay, so this was our unitary u. And then we have our initial state, which is rho tensor 0, 0. And then we have u dagger, which is again p naught tensor 1 plus p1 tensor x. OK, this is u dagger. So let's multiply this out. So first we get p naught rho um, tensor 0, 0 plus p1 rho tensor 1, 0. Okay, because x acting on 0 gives a 1. And then this multiplied by that. So now multiplying this gives p naught rho p naught tensor zero zero plus p naught rho p one tensor zero one plus p one rho p naught tensor one zero plus p one rho p one tensor one one. Okay, and now we can take the trace over our second qubit, and you see that this term vanishes, and this term vanishes, so we get p naught rho p naught plus p one rho p one. So, and what you see is um, to get an intuition what this actually does. This map it simply destroys all coherences of our initial state. Okay, so this map destroys all coherences. Since for rho is equal to rho not not rho zero one rho one zero rho one. Suppose this is the density operator of our qubit. We have that e of rho. So if this is the density operator of our qubit. Then this state here, which is E of rho, this is simply picks out the element rho 0, 0, and this picks out the element rho 1, 1, right? So we get rho 0, 0, and here the diagonals are 0, and rho 1, 1. So this what this map does. It destroys all coherences of our state. Okay, so this is now one example of such a quantum operation. And um, 
what we now do is we continue by describing these uh, quantum operations in the so-called operator sum representation. So the operator sum representation is a very useful representation because this, it will only involve operators on the level of the Hilbert space from our principal system. So if you recall this equation uh, as we had it in 3.2, so it's not on the, on the blackboard anymore, but it's like what's standing here. So we have a unitary which acts on, on the combined system of our principal system and the environment. Okay? But usually the environment can be large, it can be very, very large. So you really want to avoid having operators which are defined on this large space because we cannot deal with them. Okay? This, the, the Hilbert space of the environment can be huge. So we want to avoid this. And one way, as we will see in a second, is uh, we can avoid this uh, by the so-called operator sum representation. Okay, so this is now chapter 3.1.2. So, and the first thing that we do is uh, we suppose that the initial state of the environment is pure because as we've seen before, uh, we can, we can as it's standing here, uh, we can simply assume that it's a pure state uh, since we can always purify the environment. Okay. So let us suppose that the environment is without loss of generality initially in the pure state E not and that the set of states E k and that E k is an n basis, so it's an orthonormal basis of the environment. Okay, then we can restate equation 3.2. terms of its operator sum representation or is sometimes or often it's also called the Krauss representation. So what we do now is, you can already guess, I mean, we have now a basis of the environment, so we can perform the trace, right? Because once, since we have now a basis of the environment, we can perform the partial trace over the environment, and this is exactly what we're going to do. to a trace of the environment 
a few row tensor. Now our environment is initially in the state E not. This is square brackets here. Then U dagger. Now we perform the partial trace over the environment. So we sum over K, E K, and then U rho tensor E not E not U dagger E K. And let's rewrite this now in the following form. So we write this as E K U E not and then rho E not U dagger E K. And these expressions here are operators which live on the principal system, right? Because U is a unitary which lives on the combined system of principal system and environment. And E the E states are basis states of the environment, right? And meaning that this thing here is an operator on the principal system. And we write this as capital E. So we are EK are operators where e k is equal to this expression are operators on the state space of the principal system And they are known as the operation elements. Or sometimes called Krauss operators. Okay, so Let's go through this again, because this is important. So what we did is we now assumed that we have a basis of our environment. This is the basis, an ON basis, this EK, the cats, right? And then here we have this equation 3.2, which was our system environment model. We have supposed that system and environment undergo together a unitary evolution and to get the quantum operations of the system alone, we have to trace out the environment. Now we got a uh, ON basis of the environment, so we can perform this partial trace. So we perform this partial trace, how we defined it. And now if we reorder these things here, then we get here this thing, which is an operator on the principal system, because U lives on principal system and environment. And then here these E vectors only live on the environment. So this is an operator on the principal system, which we call EK. Right? And here we have the same thing, uh, but uh, the Him Himschen conjugate of it. So we get as the, as the um, quantum operation, we get a sum over these operators EK, rho EK dagger. And we call these, uh, these operators, which live on the principal system, we call them uh, the operation elements or Krauss operators. And now what is the beauty of this? Okay? The beauty is that this expression here only involves uh, things which live on the principal system. Okay? Here nothing lives on the, on the uh, environment anymore. Okay? Because these operators EK, they live on the state space of our principal system. And so with this trick we got rid of an operator which was U, which lives on the environment. Okay. Of course, it's not easy to, if you have, so it's not easy to get this unitary. Okay. But we're going to see that uh, this operator sum representation is very useful. 
and in the end we will see that any um, any actually what we saw right now is that any um, system environment model leads to a operator sum representation right and after the break at some point after the break we're gonna prove that every operator sum representation uh, for every operator sum representation there is a model of a system environment interaction right so we now went this way and after the break we're also gonna go this way and this tells us this is very useful this operator sum representation right because we have these operators only living on our principal system and we can al always associate a system environment model with this. And I'd suggest that um, we continue here after the break. Okay? So let's meet in 10 minutes. Let us continue now with uh, the operator sum representation. So before the break we have seen that we can write our system environment model in such a way that we are left with a sum over the so-called operation elements, which are operators living on their principal system. And now let me state a few remarks here, which are important. So the first remark is that for E, a trace preserving quantum operation We must have that one is equal to trace of E of rho, right? Then it's a trace preserving quantum operation. And now let's uh, insert this equation 3.5. So we have trace of sum over k E k rho E k dagger. And now use the cyclic property of the trace. So we have then sum over k, e k dagger, e k rho. And now this equation must hold for all density operators rho, right? And since this must hold for all density operators rho, we can conclude that this here must be the identity. Okay. So since this must hold for all rho, we find the completeness relation which is that if a sum goes operation elements ek dagger ek then we must get the identity okay note that this is for a trace preserving quantum operation right if you have a quantum operation which is not trace preserving right this can happen if this is the case then this quantum operation does not describe all possibilities of the process that we consider, but then it's not trace preserving, so meaning then it's, it must, the trace must be smaller to one then. So, non trace preserving. Quantum operations. They can also be described by the operator sum representation. However, They satisfy, or by they I mean their operation elements. They satisfy that the sum over k 
EK dagger <coughs> EK is smaller to identity, okay? What does it mean, smaller than identity? Okay, it's a very unfair, uh, uh, this is a very a new notation, I'd say. First, let me say that um, we're going to consider this more in section 3.1.3. And let me briefly note what this means. So if, an op if you have an operator A smaller than identity, then you can think of this as being identity minus A must be greater than zero. And this means that the identity minus A must be a positive operator. Okay, so the eigenvalues of one minus A must be, uh, must be positive. Right. So this is how you can read this. Right. And if it's smaller or equal, then uh, one minus A must be a Okay, so then it's positive here, it's now positive definite, sorry. Okay. And then third remark is, uh, as I've already said, the operator sum representation describes the dynamics of the principal system without having to explicitly consider properties of the environment. that's needed are the operation elements EK which act on the principal system alone And this is, this is the beauty of this representation, right? That we get rid of the environment, which can be very, very large. Okay, so what I'm going to state now is a, a interpretation of this operator sum representation, namely a physically motivated one. It's a physical interpretation. So suppose that after the unitary evolution, of the principal system and environment, uh, suppose that we then perform a projective measurement of the environment in the basis 
E K. So, say it again. What we do is, we suppose we have now a principal system in the environment, and then can interact, and they now evolve unitarily together, right? And what we do now is, we suppose that there is a projective measurement performed on the environment, okay? And with the projector are given by, this, by the uh, basis states of an orthonormal basis. And what we now calculate is, what's the post-measurement state of our principal system? if we do so, okay? So first, if the outcome uh, K occurs, then the principal system is in, in the following state. So it's in row K. Let me write this as proportional to the trace of the environment. And uh, we have the measurement operator, which is a projection of the environment on EK. And nothing happens on the principal system. And we have the unitary evolved state of our principal system and environment. So this is now equal to E K U E naught rho E naught mu dagger E K, which is E K rho E K dagger. So what we see is. Uh, up to normalization, so yet I'm, I didn't normalize, up to normalization, we get as the post-measurement state, if the outcome of our measurement of the environment is k, we get this expression here. Okay. The next thing that we do is we normalize the state. So including normalization, we have that rho k is equal to e k rho EK dagger divided by trace EK dagger EK row. Okay, now let's calculate. Actually, we know it already, but the probability is that uh, state row K occurs. So since the outcome k occurs with probability pk equal to trace of our measurement operator and then our state. That's Unitary evolution of rho e not um, which is the trace of e k 
dagger bk rho. So since this is the probability of uh, that in the outcome k occurs, the state of the principal system after the measurement becomes rho so b sorry it's e e of rho so we sum over all outcomes of the measurement with the post measurement state of our principal system multiplied by the probability that this outcome k occurs right so now let's plug this in we have for rho k this expression and for the probability pk this expression which cancels so and we are left with ek rho ek dagger so what it what it tells us is that we can interpret the operator sum representation such that we do have this common unitary evolution of principal system and environment and then there is a measurement performed on the environment right a projective measurement on the environment and the post measurement state of the principal system where this measurement this, this measurement only measures the environment but it this uh, changes kind of the state and the principal system is then in this state where this k correspond to those measurement operators of the measurement yeah, to these projectors this is how we can have a intuitive physical understanding of this expression right that each outcome each k corresponds to a different outcome of this measurement of the environment okay so what we've done so far is we started by this model of the system and the environment evolving unitarily right and what we did is we traced out the environment and we got this operator sum representation yeah. what we're going to do now is we go from bottom to top so we say suppose we have a operator sum representation and then we ask is there such a uh, is there such a system environment model which gives rise to those operation elements of this operator sum representation right so we ask, given a operator sum representation, can we find a system environment model? And the answer is yes, we can find it, and we're going to formulate this now as a theorem. So system environment model. or any operator sum representation so it's theorem 3.1 our first theorem in this chapter and it says that given a trace preserving quantum operation in the operator sum representation E of rho equal sum over k E k rho E k dagger we can construct a system environment model which 
which gives rise to the operation elements EK. Okay, this is actually an important statement because it tells us that it's not a one-way track, right? It's not such that we can, it only goes from a system environment model to operate the sum representation. It also states, okay, we can go the other way. And this is important because it already states how general these operator sum representations are. And we're going to prove this statement now. So what we assume is now that we are given an operator sum representation, right? This is what we can assume. And we prove that we can find a system environment model which gives rise to those operation elements. So <clears throat> let us now uh, suppose that let the set EK be an on basis of the environment. in a one-to-one -one correspondence with the index k of the operation elements Okay, so nothing, nothing very special happened. We simply introduced an ON basis of the environment and said that these indices are in a one-to-one -one correspondence. Okay, this we can do. And now we define an operator Let's call this U, okay? We define this now and it's so far, it's not necessarily a unitary operator. And we're going to have to show that it is unitary. I write it as u because we will see that it's unitary, but at this point, we cannot assume that it's unitary. Okay. So let's define this operator u, um, which acts on, on the state psi tensor E0 as follows. So u acting on psi e naught is equal to sum over k e k psi e k so and now the next thing that we have to uh, find out is that we can indeed construct such a operator u, which is unitary, okay? So since this operator satisfies the following, so it satisfies that psi um, e naught, and then we have u dagger acting on this, 
and we have u acting on phi e naught. It's now uh, plug in 3.12, which was the definition of our operator u. So we then have a, a sum over k and k prime of psi e k prime dagger uh, e k prime. And then here we have e k psi uh, phi times e k. Okay. So we can write as follows. Okay, since we know that this uh, R is no n basis, this is delta k k prime. So this inner product between this basis states. This reduces the sum. And then we have psi e k dagger e k phi. And now we use the completeness relation, meaning that if we sum over all those operators e k dagger e k, this gives the identity. Okay, so this gives us then uh, psi phi over psi phi. Okay, now let's recall what we did. We calculated this overlap here. Okay, this lives in, a, uh, in the state space of our principal system and the environment, which is unitary, and we got this overlap of phi and psi, so only of these two, these twos here. And this means that from here we see that we can um, use this definition of u, and from this build indeed a unitary operator which um, which does uh, preserve the norm in this which preserves the norm in this larger space okay because it always so because here we we get this the norm of phi and psi so in the larger space we can then construct u such that it does preserve the norm and it is unitary okay so it's possible to extend this to a to a unitary Since it satisfies this, it can be extended. To a unitary operator. Which preserves in a product. Uh, into a unitary operator on the state space or on the entire state space of the joint system. Okay, the next thing that we do is uh, we now use the spectral decomposition of our uh, state of the principal system. So using the spectral decomposition, so we use rho equal to sum over eigenvalues lambda j and then corresponding eigenstates the cats lambda j. Following, then we will write that the trace of this one
so what we do now is uh, we define this unitary, right? And we now calculate this thing here with u defined in 3.12. And we then will see that what we get out is the operator sum representation. And if we get out the operator sum representation, then we can always find a unitary for each operator sum representation. Okay, so there are a few lines of calculating calculation missing. Okay, so what we did so far is we wrote down the initial state of our principal system in the eigen decomposition in this form. The reason is that we now plug this in and we here now have unitary acting on this, uh, on this combined state of a state in the principal system and the state of the environment. And for these expressions here, so for this and this, we can now use equation 3.12. Okay. This is why we use the eigen decomposition because we want to use equation 3.12. So this is then equal using 3.12 to trace environment and then we have sum over j lambda j. And now let's use this. So we have sum over k and k prime. Then we have ek acting on lambda j and e k and then we have here lambda j e k prime dagger and e k prime okay now as next step um, we can rewrite this actually such that you can see it better. Okay, I simply rewrote this such that on the left hand side we have uh, all what's living in the principal system and on the right hand side all what's living in the environment because now we can perform the partial trace over the environment so we have here an e k prime e k this gives us a delta k, k prime, so the sum over k reduces. And I also now uh, switch the sums, so such that we have sum over k, and then we have e k, and then sum over j, lambda j, lambda j, lambda j, and e k dagger. Okay, and this uh, simply our uh, initial state of the principal system. So what we get is sum over k, e k rho, e k dagger. And this is what we wanted to see. And this finishes the proof because what we just saw is that um, we found, so given a operator sum representation, we found a unitary in 3.12 which does give rise to this operator sum representation. 
Okay? So meaning that for, uh, for every operator sum representation, we can find a, a system environment model, meaning the unitary, which gives rise to this operator sum representation. Okay. So let me briefly summarize what we've seen so far. So we started by modeling the interaction of a principal system with an environment via a unitary transformation of both. And this led us then to the operator sum representation, which is convenient because it only involves operators which live on the principal system. So with this we kind of got rid of all the stuff from the environment. And this is good because the environment is usually very, very large and we don't want to deal with things living on the environment. And now the beauty is that it, it's not only a one-way track, so we can also go the other way, meaning that given an operator sum representation, we can always come up with a system environment model, which gives rise to this uh, operation elements. Okay, so this was now one approach that we, that we did. We are now going a much more general approach. And uh, this will lead us now to the Krauss representation theory, uh, to the Krauss representation theorem. And I think we can possibly state this today and we're going to prove this the next time. And this Krauss representa representation theorem is based on a more general description of a quantum operation. Okay? So let us first now think what kind of properties does a general quantum operation has to satisfy. Okay, so this is chapter 3.1.3, the Krauss representation theorem. So it's reasonably it's reasonable to assume that a general quantum map with domain and range uh, H, which is the Hilbert space, meaning that we have a map which maps from H to H Okay, so note that it's not necessarily a trace-preserving operation, right? So in the very beginning, we defined for the beginning a trace-preserving quantum operation as an operation mapping density operators to density operators. Now we're considering a more general class, namely maps which simply map from H to H, okay? And we are trying to come up with, uh, with assumptions which must be hold for quantum operations which map from the Hilbert space to the Hilbert space. So it's reasonably assumed that those operations must satisfy the following properties. So it's P1, let's call this P1. Namely, that E is completely positive this is usually abbreviated by CP for completely positive and what it means is that E of A is greater or equal to zero for all operators A so greater or equal zero means positive so uh, the state that we get out from this map is positive for all positive operators. And A lives on the Hilbert space H. And moreover, that the identity tensor E okay, acting on B, that this is positive for all positive operators B, where B lives on uh, the, the Hilbert space of the environment and the uh, 
and the principal system. Okay, and what this means is uh, nothing is happening here on the environment and we have our quantum operation on the principal system. And for a positive operator defined on this combined system, the outcome must also be positive, right? So it means here we do something, and here we, we're doing nothing, and the outcome must be positive, which is a, which is a, a reasonable assumption. So this was the first assumption for a, for a general quantum operation, that it must be positive. The reason is that we cannot deal with a state which is not positive, right? Well, the second assumption goes into uh, probabilities. So the second assumption will tell us that we cannot exceed probability 1. Right? So, so far, we, we've considered only trace-preserving quantum operations. And trace-preserving meaning that the probabilities are, are conserved. Right? But I already... Uh, told at some point that there are quantum operations which are not trace preserving and in this case uh, it's such that the description of this quantum operation does miss some process so they're not not the full process is not described then by this quantum operation and the result is then that the trace of the outcoming state is uh, smaller to one, right? Then it's not trace preserving. And in this case, uh, our operation does not describe everything. But what we can for sure say is that the trace of the outcome must lie between zero and one, right? So this is the second assumption that we make. So the trace must satisfy that zero smaller equal trace of E of rho small equal one for all uh, for all density operators rho And as a third assumption, we assume that E, yeah, quantum operation is linear. And this is, I mean, this is uh, a good assumption because quantum mechanics is linear. So I think we do not need to justify why we assume that this is linear. Okay? If it would not be linear, we would have a problem because we describe quantum mechanics uh, as a linear theory. So we assume that E the quantum operation is linear, which means that E acting on an ensemble lambda j, P j, rho j is equal to sum over j, P j, E of rho j for all probabilities P j greater equal to zero and the probabilities summing to one. Okay, so this is actually all assumptions that we, that we now come up which a general quantum operation must satisfy, right? Let's go again. So we want it to be positive. So we want that it maps positive operators to positive operators, called completely positive. We want it to be, uh, we want the trace to be between zero and one in order uh, that we do not, that the probabilities do not exceed one. And we want it to be linear, because quantum mechanics is linear. And um, so I, again, I, I want to say again, OK, I want to state again uh, the assumption P2. OK, in the script, I say that if the trace of E of rho is smaller than 1, then E does not provide a complete description of all possible transitions, right? And this, I, when I said before something is missing, this is exactly what I mean, that it does not describe the complete 
transition of my state. So something is missing. The map does not describe everything. There's something missing, and that's why we get out probabilities which sum to a value which is smaller to one. Okay, then it's not completely positive. There something is missing. But this is a good assumption for a very general quantum operation. And what I'm going to state now is Krauss representation theorem, which we're going to prove next time. And what the Krauss representation theorem tells us is that um, a quantum operation, so a map E, does satisfy those three uh, conditions, P1, P2, and P3, if and only if there is a operator sum representation. And this tells you now the power of this operator sum representation, right? We have some very general uh, assumptions for a quantum operation, and it's an if and, if, if and only if statement, meaning that if and only if those assumptions hold, we have an operator sum representation. That's theorem. 3.2, which is called the Krauss representation theorem. So this is a very important theorem in quantum information theory. And that's why we're also going to prove it, and the proof is going to take us some time. But I'd like to prove it because it's, because it's so important. Right? So the map E. satisfies P1, P2, and P3 if and only if it has an operator some representation let me recall that this is also called a Krauss representation e of rho equal to sum over j e j rho j dagger For some set of operators EJ with those operators acting on the Hilbert space of the principal system and being linear and satisfying that the sum over j e j dagger e j smaller equal to the identity. Okay, this statement again you can see it as one minus this expression here must be positive. Okay, meaning that all the eigenvalues of this expression must be smaller or equal to one. And, um, okay, one more thing. Here we also explicitly stated that the, those EJs are linear, okay? And before we simply assumed that it's linear because we're always dealing with linear operators. But uh, this is important that it's linear. And, well, this is the Krauss representation theory, theorem. It's a very important theorem. And as I said, we're going to prove this next time, which is next Monday because on Thursday it's public holiday. Okay, so I'm going to see you next week on Monday, and then we're going to prove this here.